The Clash, The Stooges, Ramones, or Sex Pistols? Who is the most important punk rock band of all time? That is a debate which will go on likely forever, but certainly one of the most important bands ever in terms of punk rock is the Sex Pistols. Between 1975 and 1978, the band had five official members. Johnny Rotten, Steve Jones, Paul Cook, Glenn Matlock, and of course Sid Vicious who replaced Glenn Matlock on bass in 1977. I did an interview with Glenn Matlock where he talked about Sid Vicious and his time with the Sex Pistols. I've included the full interview at the end of this video. If you want to skip ahead to the interview, the time code is in the description box below. Now, as mentioned, the band had five official members, though you could argue the most important person involved with the Sex Pistols was the band's manager, Malcolm McLaren. The importance of Malcolm McLaren in the story of the Sex Pistols is sometimes overlooked. And so, with this video, I'll be shedding some light on how instrumental Malcolm McLaren was to the history of the band. The following is a clip from my interview with Glenn Matlock, where he, in his own words, synopsizes the relationship between Malcolm McLaren and the band. He was very good at helping us, at getting things going, and nobody would have heard of us if it wasn't for him. But nobody would have heard of him if it wasn't for us. So, it was quite a symbiotic relationship there. The following is from the book Guns, Cash, and Rock and Roll by writer Steve Overbury, where he looks at the history of Malcolm McLaren and the Sex Pistols. Quote, You'd think that having built the most notorious band in the history of rock, he could have done a little more to keep them together. Most aspiring managers would have happily part ways with a testicle to be in Malcolm McLaren's position after the success of Nevermind the Bullocks and a hugely controversial American tour that garnered front-page press all over the world. Okay, things weren't perfect. The band hated one another's guts, and Sid, John Richie Beverly, had just scored, jacked up, died, and had to be resuscitated, but hey, this was the Sex Pistols. However, from day one, it almost seemed that McLaren was trying to scupper the Pistols' chances, or at least he seemed unable to stop them from doing it themselves. In the days and decades that followed the band's demise, McLaren would have us believe that he hit the destruct button intentionally, that it had all been to do with his breathtaking situationalist arch take on life. Cash from Chaos. In reality, it looked to be more to do with attention deficiency, a pathological bend for destruction, and the friction between McLaren and Leiden. Malcolm changed the name and facade of his King's Road shop at least four times. He became bored with Bow Wow Wow just as they looked like making it. And he attempted to destroy Adam and the Ants before they even started. He may not have been a situationalist, but he was certainly a revisionist. There arguably isn't one definitive account of Malcolm's words, actions, or deeds. Certainly not one spoken by him anyway. And while his memoirs are entertaining, they would seem to depict him as insecure at times and a confident liar at others. Yet Malcolm is one of the greats. A great creator, a great character, a great agitator, a great thorn in the side with a mind seemingly unencumbered by a sense of logic or reality. And exactly the same could be said of his partner in crime, Johnny Rotten, born John Lydon. Somewhat surprisingly, McLaren's real name is McLaren. Although he never knew his real father, a member of the Royal Engineers, who, if you listen to Malcolm, doubled as a cat burglar. Malcolm Sr. split when Malcolm Jr. was two. Young Malcolm was brought up by his would-be actress mother, Rose Corey Isaacs, and was known during his youth as Malcolm Edwards, Edwards being the surname of his stepfather. Malcolm professes great love for his gran, who he boasted was descended from Portuguese royalty. McLaren had a torrid time at a number of schools. A short spell at a wine merchant's, and an even shorter one with a haberdasher followed. A teenage Malcolm started drifting around the west end of London, and was drawn to the nexus that was Carnaby Street, and the nearby St. Martin's Art School. In the evenings, he was in the clubs. One night with the Teddy Boys, another with the Beats, trying to find a sect that would have him. It wasn't until he enrolled at St. Martin's that he felt he belonged. Having bought a black polo neck and being a poser on the scene, he said, I was now going to get this initiation. I meant, I was more bonafide. Now I was a member of the club. However, his mother had different ideas. When she heard he would be drawing pictures of naked models, she had him withdrawn. A furious Malcolm then bungled an audition for Rada before wheedling his way into Harrow Art School. His disapproving parents put the spoke in again. Why wouldn't he get a proper job? Malcolm went on the run. One legend, as told by Craig Broomberg and related in his book The Wicked Ways of Malcolm McLaren, has him fleeing London with a small rucksack and wandering the Kent countryside. He ran into an old black man who was also on the road, and the odd couple traveled together, sleeping rough, first to Eastbourne, and then onto a monastery. After saying goodbye to his traveling companion, Malcolm says he hitchhiked to St. Ives to work with the sculptress Barbara Hepworth, 
and stayed there for a few months before returning to London, now calling himself Malcolm Corey, his grandmother's middle name, and bristling with the absolute conviction that he was at last an artist. Broomberg also says none of Malcolm's friends can recall his ever having been away. It wasn't a triumphal return to the big city by a long chalk. The account goes, and some of it could be true, that he slept variously in a graveyard, the backseat of a fellow student Gordon Swire's car, and a brothel. Swire had a sister called Vivian, who just married Derek Westwood. She worked for a band management company that handled a band called The Detours, who became the high numbers, who became the who. The die was cast, some may say. When Gordon moved into a big house in Clapham, Malcolm blagged a room while a recently separated Vivian Westwood with her three-year-old son, Ben, took another. He insinuated himself into Vivian's bed over the months. Now he had a base, a girl, and when she got pregnant, a baby. This was 1967, Vietnam and all. There was something in the air, youth was on the move, and while some opted to sit quietly, skin up, and play Sergeant Pepper, the students of London and Paris were limbering up for confrontation. The legend goes that Malcolm got himself arrested for burning an American flag in Grosvenor Square. He attended Croydon College of Art, where classmates included Robin Scott, who went on to write and perform pop music, as M and Jamie Reed, who designed the Nevermind the Bullocks album sleeve and put a safety pin through Her Majesty's lower lip. Agitators all, the trio took part in a six-day occupation of college rooms before Malcolm moved on yet again to another art school, the renowned Goldsmiths College. There he encountered the Situationists, a French-born clique whose anti-art stance took quite a bit of understanding because they prided themselves on having no manifesto. A pseudo-revolutionary movement, its activities were mainly restricted to daubing slogans such as Sous les paves, la plage, under the paving stones, the beach, on walls. Johnny Rotten is characteristically dismissive of the Situationalists, as he recounts in his book. I always thought it was foolishness, art students just being art students. The trouble was they thought about organized chaos. They were too structured for my liking. Word games and no work. Malcolm's ready revolutionary sidekick and bedmate became the demutive South African Helen Wallington Lloyd, later to star in The Great Rock and Roll Swindle. Together with Malcolm, she raided the college paint shop and the canteen, liberating tubes of poster color and sandwiches. Helen had led a sheltered life in South Africa and found Malcolm's antics amusing. He was an agitator, she said in John Savage's England is Dreaming. There were debates at the students' unions, and Malcolm used to put things in terms they could relate to because he's not an intellect. He had more of a ducking and diving kind of life. He loved art, but he didn't want to make pictures for people to buy. He wanted to instigate something and be an imp, an itch in somebody's knickers. The climax of Malcolm's college career came as he convinced the authorities to let him run a free festival. There were to be discussions with R.D. Lang, Malcolm X, and William Burroughs. Bands would include The Pretty Things and King Crimson. Other bands awaiting confirmation were Pink Floyd, The Rolling Stones, and John Lennon, no less. When none of the bands turned up, there was a mini-riot. The police were called, but when the heat was on, Malcolm was nowhere to be seen. This was a first valuable exercise in chaos creation. Yet Malcolm's head was soon somewhere else. He decided to become a filmmaker and had a project about Oxford Street in mind, for which he needed a professional movie cinema. The college obliged and Malcolm shot miles of material with the borrowed machine. Somehow, though, the camera was lost. It was the 70s, a new era, and the name Malcolm Edwards didn't seem to fit the times. Malcolm applied for a passport and gave his surname as McLaren. Vivian had long been supporting her two boys and Malcolm by selling handmade mirrored earrings to market stalls and the shops of the Portobello Road. The mini business had developed with Malcolm's help. He'd introduced old radios, pictures, and other assorted tat of the period to the range. Setting up their own retail outlet now seemed like an obvious move. On the outlook for the premises, they happened upon 430 Kings Road, situated at the wrong end of the fashionable boulevard at a time when its previous management had either lost interest or simply disappeared. Photographs of the period show McLaren in full Ted gear, draped suit, gold waistcoat, brothel creepers, the lot. It was timely. There was a rock revival going on. Charlie Gillet had just started his honky-tonk radio program, and the Rock On record shop opened up on the Portobello Road. McLaren called their shop, let it rock, and the Teds would come in and jostle at the till with the Chelsea shopping set. When the shop was asked to provide the togs for the rock and roll revival film, That'll Be the Day, starring David Essex and Ringo Starr, Malcolm scented success, and, in an expansionist mood, he and Vivian took a stall at a New York fashion show. There they ran into Sylvain Sylvain and Johnny Thunders of the New York Dolls, themselves wannabe designers selling homemade this and that. As well as the seminal dolls, 
Malcolm claims to have met Andy Warhol and Patti Smith on this trip, and on his return boasted that the striking-looking Vivian was to have a part in one of Warhol's films. Soon, however, his fevered mind started to wander elsewhere, as had his eye, and he began spending less time in the shop. Having tired of the Teds, he claimed he was cooking up a new image for 430 Kings Road, bikers and biker wear. The new incarnation would be called Too Fast to Live, Too Young to Die, a slogan that American biker gangs had started using after Jane Dean's death in a car crash. A new range of clothes, oddities like a t-shirt with chicken bones chained onto it in the shape of rock and roll, attracted new punters. Iggy Pop dropped by. Jimmy Page and Marion Faithful were regulars. When the New York Dolls came to Europe, McLaren hitched along with them as their most devoted fan. Another idea was forming in his head. He reasoned that if rock stars liked wearing his clothes, then he should have his own band wear his clothes. Since he couldn't play a note, he would run a band, or specifically, this band. The Dolls' cartoon-like flash and trash held a strong appeal. It became his ideal fantasy. He made clothes for them, hung out backstage with them, and went to parties with them. Sylvain Sylvain has said, There never was a bigger Dolls groupie than Malcolm McLaren. When the Dolls went home, Malcolm became instantly bored despite the success of the shop, which was still attracting rock luminaries as well as assorted rock fringe personalities like NME writer Nick Kent, who was seeing the shop's latest salesperson, Chrissy Hind. Another shop worker was Glenn Matlock, who was attending St. Martin's and moonlighting at Too Fast silk screening t-shirts. Matlock was aided by Bernie Rhodes, who had previously worked at the famous rich hippie shop Granny Takes a Trip, where Keith Richards used to buy his stage clothes. Bernie, a blues buff, was also running a Renault repair shop and became thick as thieves with Malcolm in the early Pistols era before plowing his own furrow when he went off to run The Clash. The shop was revamped again, and two dead-end kids with a certain look in their eyes started hanging around it. Steve Jones and Paul Cook were bona fide street urchins and school rejects. It was Jones who had the idea for starting a band and lobbying Malcolm to run it, although in private he was ambivalent about his future manager. I thought Malcolm was a bit of a weirdo, he said. McLaren's interest in the band idea was aroused. Rock journalist Nick Kent commented on Malcolm's dreaming. He was really in love with the myth of the working class, barely articulate rock star. He was a classic Shepherd's Bush yobo from a broken home, the son of an Xboxer and a hairdresser. I was brought up near Goldhawk Road, Jones said. Down Bendo Road, Little Streets, West Indian and Irish people. Wild. Cook was just as disadvantaged as Jones, but steadier. A trait that manifested itself throughout the Pistol's short and brilliant career, and a quality you need as a drummer. The duo were in musical partnership, if music is the word, with another school friend called Wally Nightingale, who was in the band principally because his parents' house was big enough for rehearsals. When the trio, loosely known as the Swankers, needed a bass player, Malcolm was at hand to introduce them to Glenn Matlock. When the band needed equipment, Jones would steal it, and more besides. He is supposed to have burgled Ronnie Wood's house and taken a fur coat away. Keith Richards' shine walk home yielded a color TV and some clothes. Cook drum kit came from the BBC. A tuner was swiped from a Moxie music gig, and two guitars arrived from Rod Stewart's mansion in Windsor. Miscellaneous speakers and amps were dragged out of other bands' vans, parked up for the night. But the prize hall was an entire PA system and microphones from a David Bowie gig at the Hammersmith Odeon, which they swiped in the dead of the night. Jones plagued the life out of McLaren to attend rehearsals, and he eventually caved in and went along. He didn't like what he saw. He thought Jones was a rubbish singer, Cook was let in, and Wally was out of the game, as far as he could see. He took Jones to take over the guitar playing, to sack Wally, and to look for a singer, advice that perhaps unfortunately for Wally turned out to be good. When McLaren brought the elegantly wasted, leather-clad enemy journalist Nick Kent down to see them, Kent had a bash at playing the guitar. Jones's ambition switch was turned on as he saw his band in a different light. However, Malcolm could still only see a motley bunch of local no-hopers. He told Vivian to mind the store and told Bernie Rose to mind the swankers while he went off to New York in search of his playmates, the Dolls. Oh, and his American ex-shop assistant girlfriend, Addie. So obsessed was he with the Dolls that despite the fact they already had management, he put himself into the role without earlier contracts or commitment from the band and knowing that, if anything came out of his efforts, he would very likely be rowed out of the game. Deluded as this perhaps was, he made plans. First step get them into rehab. Second step, dress them all up. He figured that in fiercely capitalist America, maybe a blatant communist theme would have the prerequisite shock value. So rag trade Malcolm saw red, got straight on the phone to Vivian, and demanded she knock up crimson vinyl wet look jeans and zip t-shirts for the whole band. Third step, get some gigs. He booked the band into a tour of Florida clubs, as far away from New York's narcotics convenience stores as he could conceive. The gigs were a disaster. Unsurprisingly, the costumes were a big mistake. 
Two of the band bailed out and flew back to New York to score some dope, leaving Malcolm brokenhearted and broke. He had to be driven back, he had no driving license, the length of the country in a clapped-out station wagon. Back in the Big Apple, Addie rejected him. Richard Hell turned down his offer to come back to the UK and be the lead singer in this new band he had, and Malcolm's big American adventure was over. In London, Nick Kent was making plans to dump his writing career, take over the Swankers, and turn them into a band in his own leather-clad image. McLaren thought about and then rejected the idea, but galvanized by the takeover bid, he resolved to solve the singer issue. The Bay City Rollers had just exploded into the charts and Malcolm was thinking pop. Perhaps Scotland was the new Liverpool. Perhaps there was someone north of the border who could take the microphone in hand. Bernie and Malcolm drove north on a trawling mission and somehow came across a petrol pump attendant called Midge Uri. Did Midge want to move to London and sing with this great new band? No thanks was the reply. Uri was in the process of signing his own band, Silk, to Bell Records. Would history have swung on a different tack if Midge hadn't rejected Malcolm's advances? Would Rotten have ever done, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here? Would Band Aid ever have fed the world? Would the Sex Pistols have had a number one with Vienna? Would Sid be dead? Thwarted, Malcolm returned to the King's Road shop alongside a new manageress, the fearsomely beehive Jordan. The new regime propelled the clothes designs to new levels of perversion. The silk screeners, Matlock and Bernie, thought that McLaren had gone too far this time. So did the police, apparently, who, as legend has it, raided the shop and took a lot of stock away with them. Back to the band. Malcolm wouldn't take them seriously with Wiley in the lineup. He wanted Jones to play guitar. This guitar. And Malcolm produced Sylvain's White Gibson Les Paul, which he had acquired. Even the acquisitive Jones's eyes widened. His erstwhile loyalties evaporated. Matlock was deputized to sack Wally. The dirty deed was duly done. Matlock became the key to the story soon after the Wally sacking when he spotted a sneering, hunchback loudmouth with peroxide hair in the Rosebuck pub just up from the shop. Craig Broomberg's book gives us an impression of the early John Lydon. Everything he says is F you, F that. One long hyperventilated howl of hate against any target he can get his tongue around. Pop music, people over 30, politicians, he even hates himself. Ideal. Matlock, having just thrown an old band member out, was now duty-bound to get a new one in, and John was persuaded to go back to the shop and meet the skeptical McLaren. Vivian reckoned she'd already spotted John and his mates, but had thought that Sid Vicious was the most interesting of all of them. Malcolm told ContactMusic.com in 06, Vivian was infatuated with Sid. Lydon, wearing his Pink Floyd shirt with I Hate scrawled above their name, used an old shower head as a microphone. Someone put Alice Cooper's I'm 18 on the shop jukebox, and John jumped around, yelled a bit, crashed into things, and left the judges doubled up with laughter. A star was born. Malcolm reckons he spotted the punk pioneer in the making there and then. I had an eye, he said. I knew he had something. Just as I knew Jones had something. The Sex Pistols were doing something different from everybody else, said John. And they weren't liked, which was absolutely brilliant. They were totally horrible people. Vivian was the most awful old bag, and that really fascinated me. The hunch spitting hooligan act we grew to know and love was formed early on in Lydon's life. He contracted meningitis as an eight-year-old, which had put him in a coma and wiped his memory. He was off school for a year. It left him with bad eyesight, as his mother told Fred Vermorel in his book, Sex Pistols, The Inside Story. I don't know if you ever noticed John. He stares, sort of a stare in his eyes. He was anti-establishment from the off. At school, I knew we were being fobbed off, Lydon recalls. I learned hate and resentment there. He met Sid at college. Sid had spent his early years in Ibiza, where his mother had been dumped by his father. She survived by selling dope to the hippies. When mother and son returned, life continued in the same chaotic hand-to-mouth vein. Mother and son were close, too close probably, and the many rows often left Sid dozing on park benches and contemplating prostitution as a way out of the claustrophobic relationship. John and Sid together with another college friend, Ja Wobble, real name John Wardle, they were often referred to as the Three Johns, started hanging out on the King's Road, dressing madly and spitting at people in flares. I used to wrap myself in trash, Lydon says, like Richard III, deformed, hilarious, grotesque. Dogs barked at me. He looked really interesting, says Steve Jones. There was something about him that magnetized you to him. He had all the punk stuff on, the safety pins and everything. That was nothing to do with McLaren. He was wild looking. Punk was a peculiarly British phenomenon. Okay, the debate rages on. Some say that Iggy was the first punk way back in 1968, that the Ramones were ahead of the crowd in 1975, but much as some, not Johnny, British punks would concede that they were influenced by their American cousins. That particular moth-eaten look, 
the look Richard Hell and the Voidoids claim was originally theirs, and that thrashing sound that every man and his dog claim was theirs, all gelled in the UK in some unique and dynamic package personified by Johnny Rotten and the Pistols. It has to do with rage. Despite the speed they took, the Pistols never played fast. You just think they did. Let's face it. Americans didn't have a monarchy they wanted to tear down, nor did they have a burning urge to spread the tentacles of anarchy. And where did all that rage come from? One good theory involves nuclear weapons. To be 19 years old in 1975 is to have lived all your life in the shadow of the bomb, to have known nothing except the prospect of imminent annihilation. The punks had lived out their childhood against the backdrop of student barricades, militant unionism, and pictures of body bags coming back from Vietnam. As Charlotte Pressler commented in England's Dreaming, we had been promised the end of the world as children, and we weren't getting it. The UK punk movement lent the American bands a credibility and a relevance that they would never have mustered on their own. And even if it is accepted that they had invented it, in the time-honored fashion of UK-US youth culture osmosis, the Americans bought punk back from Britain in its radicalized version. Any debt, real or imagined, the Pistols owed to the Ramones, the Voivoids or the Stooges, they paid back a thousand times over, and created a deluge of American thrash and ersatz punk that we have to endure still. It's quite difficult to give an accurate impression of what life was like in the UK in 1975, especially for a low-achieving London brat. There is commonly spouted Pistols legend that the charts were clogged up with the dinosaurs of rock and indeed, a look at the evidence shows Zeppelin in a pervasive position in the culture and the charts with physical graffiti. But Patti Smith's horses was also around, as was Bowie's Young Americans and Bob Marley Live. These weren't dinosaurs. However, the singles chart was awash with lightweight pap like the Bay City Rollers, Telly Savalas, Mud, and Typically Tropical. The only rockers in earshot were ex-rockers. Rod Stewart's Sailing was number one for four weeks, and Queen's ultimate pomposity, Bohemian Rhapsody, took up its residency at number one for what seemed like a lifetime. Elsewhere, an ailing Harold Wilson was preparing to pass his crown to an avuncular but undistinguished Jim Callahan. Maggie Thatcher loomed on the horizon, the IRA were bombing Britain, the Yorkshire Ripper had embarked on his bloody spree, and Dixon of Doc Green was still on the telly. In the Sex Pistols documentary, The Filth and the Fury, John Lydon spells it out. It was cold and miserable, no one had any jobs. There was race hate, social strife, chaos, and rioting. People were fed up with the old way, but we felt powerless. The only youth movement of any note were the football hooligans who, far from being a minus rabble, had strict behavioral codes and cultural references. Leiden's book is punctuated by remarks from an Arsenal boot boy known as Rambo. Before Ziggy Stardust, you had Clockwork Orange, he says. Everybody used to dress like the Clockwork Orange film. When Clockwork Orange came out, we used to wear white boiler suits. Some wore bowler hats. Practically everybody who supported Arsenal had a white boiler suit. We were already into rows in that, but then the film came out, and that became another fashion to follow. When we played Tottenham, Everyone supporting Arsenal was clockwork orange. You'd write things like Arsenal or the manager of the team on the boiler suits. We wear red scarves in those days. You would carry canes as far as you can get away with it. But umbrellas were the thing. We had the Arsenal lot from Bethnal Green, who also dressed in the boiler suits. All the Boreham Wood Arsenal had tattoos. Newcastle fans used to come down and all dressed up like Alice Cooper, with all the black makeup and the Alice Cooper gear on. Man U fans dressed like David Bowie. The clothes salesman Malcolm McLaren identified with this tribalism. The misanthropic Rotten did not, even though he did support Arsenal. The first rehearsal was almost the end of the line for the embryonic pistols. None of them showed up, says McLaren, because they never liked Johnny Rotten. I liked Jones. Jones didn't mind me. I quite liked Cook, but to me, he was a bit boring. I brought Matlock into the group as an anchor of normality. He had a certain intelligence that I thought could be used to help Cook and Jones instruct songs. Rotten was just a little arrogant, who thought he knew everything. He hated their music. Cook and Jones were going for the tradition of mutated, irresponsible, hardcore rock power. Iggy Pop, New York Dolls, MC5, The Faces. Rotten wanted it like 60s, Captain Beefheart, all weird. We knew he couldn't sing, that he had no sense of rhythm, but he had this charm of a boy in pain. He knew all the girls were going to love him. I thought they could be the Bay City Rollers. That was in my head. I was so out of it. To think he could be the alternative to the Bay City Rollers, dour and tough, and the real thing. A genuine teenage group. For me, that was anarchy in the record business. That was enough for me. That was the best-selling point. They were like young assassins. It took on a life of its own.
At some point in 1975, McLaren left Vivian to move in with Helen Wallington Lloyd. Helen's flat became Sex Pistol Central. John looked amazing in a mohair jumper, she said, like a young Albert Steptoe. Very queenified, always moaning. I think with Malcolm they had a sexual thing. It was narcissistic. They looked so much alike. Both Aquarians, the same bone structure. They've got those eyes and they're absolutely fearless of other people's opinions. They're hard. Obviously, different things in their backgrounds made them different and also they had the gift of the gab. They'd come up with the most bizarre innovations. According to one account, John was secretive and wouldn't even tell the band what his surname was. But when Steve Jones saw him inspecting his graveyard teeth in a mirror, he said, Your teeth are rotten. You look rotten. The name stuck. Their earliest homegrown track was 17, which had music by Jones and lyrics by Rotten. That is until the chorus, I'm a Lazy Sod, which was Jones through and through, although most Pistols tracks were credited to all four members. Then came Kill Me Today and Submission. All rough and ready stuff, but gradually McLaren, who, as yet had no contract with the band, thinking that this was to his advantage, began to realize that they were starting to sound good. Very good, in fact. Better than the New York Dolls, in fact. It was down to the St. Martin student Matlock to get them their first gig proper at his college. The Pistols supported Bazooka Joe, who boasted Adam Ant as a member. In the set was the Shepherd's Bush anthem Substitute, and the small faces What You Gonna Do About It. With Rotten's negative version of the lyric, I want you to know that I hate you, baby. I want you to know I don't care. The St. Martin's gig was a ferocious racket. Someone pulled the plug on them, and there was a fight. No one had seen anything like it. A profoundly affected Adam Ant left his band the next day. McLaren, disturbed that a band he'd helped create, in no small part to promote his shop, showed signs of being exciting, successful even, was forced into getting off his backside to get them some gigs. By the simple expedient of phoning the venues and pretending that the Pistols were the support act, he was able to set up about 15 gigs in and around London. Ron Watts of the 100 Club recalls, They weren't booked or invited. They just arrived and said they were the support band, set up their gear, and played. There was almost always the same reaction. Stunned amazement, hilarity, and fighting. Most of the audience were long hairs who thought the band couldn't play. The Pistols all had short hair and mangled clothing at a time when you must be beaten up in the streets for just having a particular hairstyle. As Suggs observed during a BBC interview, if you came up from the suburbs and you had blue hair then, wow man, you were lucky to get out alive. A small minority of each crowd understood though. The suburban outcast made a visually striking mob. When put together with Malcolm's King's Road bondage shoppers, they found a completely unique ripped up rainbow following that attracted considerable attention and even violence everywhere they went. At one of the string of 100 club gigs, Sid Vicious whipped Nick Kent around the head with a bike chain. At another, the whole band had a stand-up row mid-set and Jones smashed up the dressing room. At a marquee gig, Rotten threw two chairs into the monitor. In High Wycombe, when supporting Screaming Lord Such, Rotten smashed up the mic stand and messed with the kid's hair in the audience. Someone went for John and the Pistols' entourage jumped on him. It was at the 100 Club that Vicious invented the pogo dance. I started the pogo because I hated Bromley Contingent, he said, and I did it because I had a chance to knock them all over the place. When Steve Jones was asked by a music journalist what his influences were, he replied, Actually, we're not into music. We're into chaos. The fevered press started talking about the Pistols in terms of spearheading a new generation. Caroline Kuhn wrote in Melody Maker, John is the elected generalissimo of a new cultural movement. Sounds magazine writer John Ingham interviewed the band with Malcolm in a cafe. Things were proceeding in an okay fashion, but then Ingham became bothered that Rotten had so far remained silent. When he finally dared rattle Rotten's cage, he got both barrels. Johnny declared, I hate hippies and what they stand for. I hate long hair. I hate pub bands. I want to change it so there are rock bands like us. Two days after the piece came out, the band played at London's Nashville and the future of British punk, as well as Adam Ant, turned out to watch them. The crowd included Tony James from Generation X, Mick Jones from The Clash, Vic Godard from Subway Sect, and Dave Vanian from The Damned. A lackluster performance was transformed when Vivian slapped someone across the face. Her boyfriend went for Vivian, and McLaren went for the boyfriend. A delighted Rotten leaped into the melee, fist flying. When the dust settled, Vivian revealed that she'd slapped the girl just because she fancied it and because the band was boring. McLaren and Bernie Rhodes began to think that if the Pistols were in the vanguard of a punk movement, then they should form some other bands to join it. And so they set about putting together the band that became The Clash. Joe Strummer had seen the Pistols when they supported his band, The 101ers. He referred to them as light years ahead of his own band, and when Rhodes asked him to join forces with him and Mick Jones and jump ship, Strummer asked how high. Mick Jones tried to recruit Chrissy Hind for the new band, which was to be called Schoolgirls Underwear. 
McLaren tried to entice her to a band based around Dave Vanian and the Rat Scabbies to be called Masters of the Backside. Another incarnation of the same band briefly held the delightful name Mike Hunt's Honorable Discharge. Malcolm sent the pistols off up north in a knackered van on a tour of pub backrooms and dodgy clubs. He took great pains to avoid the rigors of the road himself. The band fended for themselves on the trips, relying on some extent on Jones's shoplifting talents to keep them fed. Most of the gigs were short and sour. Back in town, McLaren was having trouble finding gigs for his disruptive act, so he persuaded a friend to let him have the screen on the green cinema for an all-nighter that featured The Clash, The Buzzcocks, The Stranglers, and, top of the bill, The Pistols. This is the gig that every punk never woza says they were at. However, the word was out around the record industry, so A&R men from EMI and Polydor were definitely in the audience. And they were impressed. McLaren started negotiations there and then. At the time when the usual advance for a new band was £15,000, tops, Malcolm was brazenly demanding £40,000, causing NME editor Neil Spencer to comment that punk was conceived as a ram raid on corporate pops, bank vaults, and a merry piece of snook cocking. McLaren told Simon Garfield, the author of Money for Nothing, I was never interested in being polite like other managers before me. You can keep the royalties, I used to say. Give me the money now. I thought royalties were a very abstract phenomenon to do with creating accounting, like something you might never see. I never believed what they promised, and I always thought they were all crooks. And that's a fact. They are. It was time to sign a contract with the band, he thought, and enlisting his partner as a solicitor, Stephen Fisher, he formed the notorious Glitter Best Limited, as the management company. The contract gave McLaren 25% of the band's income. In return, they would get £25 a week each. A scornful, if negligent, rotten signed it without reading it and told Glenn Matlock, who had read it, that if it turned out that there was anything wrong with the deal, then it would all be Matlock's fault. Malcolm was playing EMI against Polydor in a big way now, shuttling between their offices and spinning tall tales to each other. In the standoff, EMI blinked first, raised their bid, and signed the band for the requisite £40,000 for two albums over two years with two one-year options. The contract was drafted and signed all in one day, a deal which apparently remains the fastest the company has ever done and shows their desperation to be associated with the leading band of the punk generation. The Polydor A&R man, Chris Perry, apparently sobbed when he heard the news that they had lost the race to sign them. It was one of my blackest days, he said. I was very, very upset. The trouble started immediately. EMI booked the band into a studio to record the first single, but when Ron was caught writing slogans on the walls, they were ejected and another studio had to be found. Then Malcolm wouldn't accept the suggested producer and demanded that EMI take on Chris Thomas, who, ironically, had produced Dark Side of the Moon for Rotten's pet hate band Pink Floyd, as well as some Roxy Music albums. It turned out to be an inspired choice. Thomas with Bill Price produced the trademark wall of guitars that makes Anarchy in the UK sound as powerful and dangerous today as it did when it was recorded. Another tour was now necessary to promote the single, a single which up until then seemed obstinately glued to the shelves. Much as Malcolm didn't want to play the rock and roll game according to the establishment rules, there seemed little choice. He burned the midnight oil arranging transport, lights, PAs, and hotels, while EMI's Eric Hall sought some TV exposure. Hall sniffed out a vacant slot on Thames Television's Today magazine program that had arisen when Queen pulled out, owing to Freddie having toothache. Somehow, he convinced the show's producers that his label's recently signed Lout Band, accompanied by an entourage of bizarrely dressed fans, would make a perfect replacement for Queen and would be good TV. It wasn't just good TV, it was great TV, as the hapless and drunk host, the late Bill Grundy, fell into the trap of urging the Pistols to say foul things on live television. Priceless, you couldn't buy it. It was just the anti-establishment trigger anarchy in the UK needed, and it at last started selling nationwide. McLaren, who had resigned himself to the endless slog of gigs and record releases to incrementally raise the profile of the band, had inadvertently hit the jackpot with the first throw of the dice. Craig Broomberg, although muddling his ballgame analogy, sees this as a pivotal moment, a moment when Malcolm started claiming that he planned it all. In Craig's words, McLaren was like a lucky billiards player whose incompetent bluffing had led to a sudden, incredibly lucky scattering of pool balls into their appropriate holes. From now on, he would have to play the rest of the game as if he had been an expert from the start. The managers of Britain's provincial gig venues saw things differently, and after the furor over the TV show, the cancellations came in thick and fast. The band ended up playing only three of the proposed 19 gigs. EMI saw things differently too. The ladies that packed the records into their shelves refused to pack Anarchy in the UK and had to be talked into by the management. That made a four-page story in the papers. 
There were serious concerns at the highest level about the potential damage to the sales of the brain scanner EMI were trying to market in the U.S. because the pistols were front page news in the LA Times. Barely two months after the ink was dry on the contract, Sir John Reed, the EMI chair, addressed his shareholders and denounced the bad boys that comprised his company's new signing. Tell him to go F himself, responded the distinctly unimpressed Johnny Rotten. McLaren finally seeing the commercial upside of the uproar began sabotaging his own gigs. According to Steve Jones, I got the feeling he called up the gigs and said it's going to be hell there, and then the guys would get scared and not put us on. The pistols only had to fart to make the front pages now, and often they didn't have to do anything at all. The press just made it up. When the band was supposed to have thrown up at a Heathrow check-in desk on their way to Amsterdam, their EMI minder was able to state categorically that they'd never been to the desk. The Evening Standard ran the tale anyways to the further consternation of the EMI brass. The decision was made. The band had to be dumped. Nick Mobbs, who had signed them, refused to take part in it and handed in his notice in disgust. EMI wanted a quiet termination. McLaren went to the press bleeding about mistreatment. However, EMI thinking they could spike McLaren's guns had arranged for him to have a meeting with a young Richard Branson, who McLaren would from then on refer to as Mr. Pickle. Branson, with his unearing eye for sensation, was offering to pick up the contract. Malcolm refused to even meet the head of what he considered to be a hippie company. To him, it was an anathema. EMI handed over the £40,000 to get rid of the pistols and sent out the order that any remaining copies of Anarchy in the UK to be melted down. McLaren's scouring of London for an alternative deal proved arduous and brought to light the amazing schisms that were breaking out in the labels like EMI, Chrysalis, Warner Brothers, RCA, and CBS. While the young a &R managers and other minions were exhilarated by the pistols and what they seemed to stand for, the older executives, with more to fear and older ears, ran for cover. McLaren bemoaned the fact that the labels were all scared, but to some extent the problem may have been that he was now asking for £100,000 for his notorious band. It wasn't until Malcolm attended Midham, the music business trade show in Cannes, in late January of 97, that he met his simpatico label boss, Derek Green from a and I played this little cassette and it just blew me away, said Green. They weren't another American rock band that was churning out the same thing. I was thrilled. Thrilled. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was terribly excited. I knew at that very moment that I wanted that act badly and in this business you rarely do. The a and label, the A of which is the legendary trumpeter Herb Alpert, wasn't scared by the press clamor that surrounded the enfant terrible of British rock. They could handle it. They would milk it, they thought. Discussions began which included some of the first mutterings about a Sex Pistols film. Of Malcolm's negotiating skills, Green had this to say. He's the guy who just knows how to trick a deal. One minute he'd be charming the pants off me, the next he'd be telling me how Warner Brothers had offered them X money and that I had to beat that to get them. Of course, I had no way of knowing what was the truth. Green felt it necessary to go to LA to confer with Jerry Moss, the M of a and &M. The picture asked McLaren followed him, chasing the money. McLaren arrived at the a and lot, said Green, on a sunny 90-degree LA day, dressed in an all-black leather outfit with a chain tying his knees together. It had to be one of the funniest things I've ever seen. In March of 97, in the face of American staffers saying the band was horrible and that Green must be losing his mind, they finalized a the deal. The band signed for £75,000. Shortly afterwards, The Clash were to get £100,000 from CBS. Meantime, Rotten deposed Glenn Matlock from the band and pulled in Sid, an old friend and ally from the past who John felt was essential for the Sex Pistols despite his inability to play bass. Or anything else. And another thing. Sid came with baggage. He'd met an American groupie from the appropriately named Mainline Philadelphia who despite her youth had already attempted suicide twice. Nancy Spungen joined the Pistols' entourage. She tried to get John first, but it was hate at first sight for Leiden, who says in his biography that Nancy was a horror freak show, just crying out for a slap in the kisser. Many of us, at one time or another, actually physically hit her because she was that pushy. I know I did. Steve Jones felt the bad vibe too. There was a dark cloud with this bird. I just hated her. It was the Jubilee year in 1977, so McLaren decided that they should start work on a song Rotten had written a few months earlier. Then called No Future, it was redubbed God Save the Queen. The day after the official signing, the Pistols turned up to perform a mock signing for the benefit of the press in front of Buckingham Palace. It was the start of a long day for the Pistols, and possibly the longest day of Derek Green's life. The band leapt from the limousines, signed some scraps of paper, threw some V-signs at the large house behind them and at the cameras in front of them, and then dived off just as the police started paying them a lot of attention. 
Reconvening at a nearby hotel for a press conference, the group began drinking heavily and haranguing journalists before embarking to Wessex Studios to hear the latest mixes of the single. Here, Paul and Sid had a stand-up row, so the drink-fueled party departed to the A&M offices. There was a mini-battle in the car, as McLaren relates. Paul got the worst end of it and suffered a bashed in nose, and Sid's shoes were thrown out of the window, his foot now cut. Rotten's watch that had been bought by his mother for his birthday the previous week was smashed. He was totally furious. Steve, who had tried to stop the fight, being the toughest, was totally pissed and completely hopeless. The fight was about who was the toughest, who was the most sex pistol. The drunken band marauded around the offices. Vicious managed to break a toilet bowl and a window and insulted a female staff member. According to McLaren, Jones found some attractive staff in a lady's toilet and had a go. A few days later, as the record was being pressed, Rotten was fined for possession of amphetamine sulfate. The same evening, Rotten, Jawable, and Vicious became involved in a fracas with Whispering Bob Harris, the presenter of the Old Grey Whistle Test. Legend even has it that the Pistols allegedly threatened to kill Harris for not playing their records. The fallout from this event made its way back to Green and added to his mounting fears that he had done something terribly wrong in signing the Pistols. He rang Moss in the U.S. and offered his resignation, saying that he felt the label should keep the band but that he didn't want to work with them anymore. His boss made the decision for him. Green would keep his job and the Pistols would lose their label. A relieved Green promptly issued the following statement, There is no longer any association between a and and the Sex Pistols. Production of their single God Save the Queen, which had been tentatively scheduled for release later this month, has been halted. McLaren was summoned to the offices and unceremoniously dumped but left the meeting grasping yet another check. The band had lost their second label in less than a week. The order went out that all copies of God Save the Queen were to be destroyed. Notionally, the band now had £125,000, not bad for six months' work, but McLaren feared that its members had become pariahs, that they would never get a label to take them on now and neither could they get any gigs. The band prospered though. Their wages were hiked to £40 a week, and although Rotten was already beginning to become curious about where all the money was going and had asked for the accounts, revealing a shrewdness that the others lacked, he was not yet to get it, or at least not all of what he was due, for a further nine years. McLaren was hatching plans. He approached Peter Cook about writing a script for a film. Cook mused and then passed. Monty Python's Graham Chapman and Till Death Do Us part writer John Spite knocked out a treatment, but it was rejected by McLaren. Ironically, Till Death Do Us part wouldn't have been a bad name for a Pistols film. Also discarded was Richard Branson, who was still sniffing for a deal and phoning McLaren almost daily. This could be interpreted as either a very shrewd or recklessly foolish move by McLaren, since Virgin was the only label in town prepared to take on the bad boys. God Save the Queen was also a time-sensitive project. The Queen's Jubilee weekend was only weeks away. Malcolm tried to strike record deals in individual countries now. Lots of small deals that would amount to one big deal. But the only one that worked out was with the French label Barclay, who signed the Pistols to a three-album deal for £27,000. So in the end, Malcolm had little choice but to sign with Virgin in a complex deal that effectively gave the band £65,000 for an album. That there was a deal at all was a miracle, since McLaren and Branson didn't like each other. Bernie Rhodes encapsulated the antipathy between the two men. Just as Lydon looked at McLaren and thought, I'll have you, so McLaren looked at Branson and thought the same. Problems weren't long in coming. There was a row over whether Virgin should have their name on the label. They weren't that keen to volunteer for the inevitable opprobrium that would follow the record's release. Then, deja vu. The staff at the pressing plant refused to manufacture the single because of its content. When that hiccup was overcome, the printers refused to have anything to do with the sleeve. No sooner was that solved than the TV company refused the proposed advert, while the comrades at the commercial radio stations did likewise. The climax came when the BBC, with the exception of John Peel, refused to play the song on the grounds of gross bad taste. When three major chains of shops refused to stock the single, it seemed like only a minor snag in comparison to what had gone before. The music press, however, rallied to the cause. They loved the record, and the band made the covers of Enemy, Record Mirror, and Melody Maker. God Save the Queen sold 150,000 copies in the five days before the Jubilee weekend. With exquisite timing, the impact of the single was like a bomb going off in the Buckingham Palace yard. While the disaffected youth of the UK had discovered a new bunch of heroes, the establishment had discovered a vile new public enemy. Matters became worse when McLaren booked a boat to run up and down the Thames with the band playing on it in a parody of the river trip Her Majesty was due to make. Rotten gave a furious performance as the boat approached the Palace of Westminster encircled by police launches. 
A panicking captain cut the power to the band as the vessel burst and McLaren ensured the affair went into pop history by standing at the top of the gangplank and shouting at the cops. Eleven were arrested, some of whom had to endure a not altogether unsurprising kicking in the back of the police van. God Save the Queen was selling by the boatload now, but Rod Stewart's I Don't Want to Talk About It made number one instead, despite the distributor's assurance to McLaren that the pistols were outselling Stewart two to one. Could someone somewhere have rigged the charts? To suggest that somebody on high was putting the kibosh on God Save the Queen is surely a paranoid fantasy. But Labour MP Marcus Lipton said in a Daily Mirror article, if pop music is going to be used to destroy our establishment institutions, then it ought to be destroyed first. The Sunday Mirror echoed its sister paper. Punish the punks, it thundered, and the rabble were aroused. A week later, Rotten was attacked by a gang, as he explained in his biography. I was stabbed right near the studio while we were recording the Bullocks album. This is before the record was even released. We went to a pub round the corner, not far from the same old Arsenal area in Highbury where I was brought up. This bunch of goons just tore into us with grucha knives, blades, razors, the lot. I was with the producer Chris Thomas and Bill Price, the engineer. We managed to run to the car park and lock ourselves in Chris's car. This mob smashed a car and window screen while we were inside it. They broke one of the windows and stuck a blade in. I had on a pair of very thick leather trousers at the time. It went straight down them. If I'd had on anything else, it would probably have ripped my leg out. The blade stuck in my knee. I got a stiletto blade pushed straight into my hand next to my thumb. It came out the other side by my little finger. That affected the tendons in my left hand. I'll never play guitar again because of that. Boo hiss. I can't close a proper left fist. That's a bit hard because I'm left-handed. I thought I was going to die. Then Paul Cook took a battering. Some sections of the public were clearly not amused by young John's taunting record. We love our queen, they shouted. Rotten added, If they had hung us at Traitor's Gate, 56 million would have cheered. We declared war on England without meaning to. To top it all, Sid was in hospital with hepatitis after using a dirty needle and no one was visiting him except Nancy. Yet during a period when they needed him, Malcolm seemed distracted. His mind was jitterbugging. He and Vivian changed the shop yet again. New stock, a new look, and a new name. Set at Yaneri's. Rotten was holed up with Sid, Nancy, and Jaw Wobble and packets and packets of amphetamines, while Jones and Cook moaned about him. McLaren egged them on. Did he resent John's new status as the leader of the punk movement? Did he resent Rotten's talent and feel it was he who should be the star, really? It was at this juncture that he decided to write, produce, and direct the film about the pistols. This would be his vehicle. Maybe he'd found a way to be the star at last. Rotten was welcome to his notoriety and celebrity. It has been speculated that this was effectively when the pistols broke up when they divorced one another in their heads. But in the end, Malcolm couldn't do everything regarding the film. He'd need others to write and direct it, but at the same time, he couldn't bring himself to surrender control to anyone. Sandy Liberson, a big wheel at 20th Century Fox, loved the film idea and helped McLaren to hunt down a director. Brits Ken Loach and Stephen Frears looked at the project, but Loach saw only differences between him and McLaren, while Frears was rejected by the band. And then Russ Meyer's name came up. The controversial director of films such as Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and Faster Pussycat Kill Kill seemed ideal for the job. In turn, Meyer, whose career was on the skids, saw the logic of making a movie about this too-hot-to-handle Brit band with that so-great name, The Sex Pistols. Malcolm thought Meyer and the band were made for each other. He dropped everything, including the planning of a Pistols tour of Sweden, and went courting in Hollywood. He found a scriptwriter and the two of them locked themselves away for a month, drafting a 600-page treatment. Meyer hated it and threw it in the bin, but he signed up for the project anyways. Meantime, Virgin had released Pretty Vacant, which steamed up the charts. Leiden agreed to make a promotional video, surely their finest featuring the classic Steve Jones nodded hanky on the head, to Virgin's requirement and also agreed to a Capitol Radio interview. However, he balked at letting the video be shown on top of the pops, so he urged McLaren to get on the phone from Los Angeles and have it pulled, but conveniently, the BBC wouldn't return it. Left to their own devices, on a successful and uneventful Scandinavian tour, the two Johns started openly bad-mouthing McLaren. Malcolm I honestly hate, said Sid to a newspaper man. In return, it seemed that Malcolm was equally hostile towards Sid, whose drug use ironically was perhaps also the grist to the mill, and the mill was his movie. Leiden met up with Meyer and his writer at a lunch, and the Americans tried to get their brains around John's street vernacular. A weed is a pansy. If you don't know that, it's just an indication of how stupid you Americans are. It didn't go so well. Meyer couldn't see eye to eye with McLaren either. I could never really put him together, he told Search and Destroy magazine. And I'm gregarious. I get along with almost everybody, except a wife or so. McLaren tried to wrest some control of the film from Meyer on behalf of the band. He 
he said, at a time when it was clear he barely had any influence over the Sex Pistols. Tales of the breakdown in relations seep back to Fox in the USA. One of the board of directors was Princess Grace of Monaco, no less, and she couldn't see why the company was involved with a horrid punk group. It seems yet another monarch had taken exception to the Sex Pistols. Myers left London, saying he would sue McLaren. Fox coughed up £150,000 to make McLaren go away. ka -ching! went the cash register at Pistols HQ. Virgin, who had been dragging their feet over the release of the Nevermind the Bullocks album on the basis that they could make more money by releasing the individual singles from it, were finally persuaded to release it. Branson had been spurred into action by Barclay, who had released the album in France and were threatening to export thousands of copies to the UK. There was an immediate furor over displaying the sleeve with the word bollocks stripped through the middle of it. W.H. Smith, Woolworths, and Boots refused to stock it, but it had 150,000 advanced orders and went straight to number one. One Virgin shop record manager was charged with offenses under the 1989 Incident Advertisement Act for displaying bollocks posters, and in the customary era of farce that seemed to surround much Sex Pistol activity, when the manager was hauled before the court in Nottington, the celebrated QC and writer John Morton Murr found himself arguing in his defense that bollocks was a perfectly ordinary Anglo-Saxon word. He said in his summing up, One wonders why a word which has been dignified by writers from the Middle Ages in the translation of the Bible to Dylan Thomas and George Orwell, and which you may find in the dictionary, should be singled out as criminal because it is on a record sleeve by the Sex Pistols. It was because it was the Sex Pistols and not Donald Duck or Kathleen Ferrier that this prosecution was brought. The chairman of the bench was forced to agree that it was purely because it had been the Sex Pistols. Much as my colleagues and I wholeheartedly deplore the vulgar exploitation of the worst instincts of human nature, he said, we must reluctantly find you not guilty. After a short tour of Holland, a tour of the USA was mooted. The U.S. Embassy wouldn't grant visas because of the array of criminal convictions the Pistols had accumulated between them, and it was necessary for the American record company to put up a surety of one million to get the ban on their way. Jamie Reed felt an ill wind. Everybody knew that something awful was coming up. Malcolm's somewhat perverse hand rested on the selection of the gigs. We had a choice, he said. Madison Square Garden, one show, dollar a ticket, coming in by helicopter, or we could do what we wanted to do. And I realized it might be better to play the southern states, do the places where no one goes, and continue the story of this group. Because to play Madison Square Garden at that time tended to sum it up and make you end up doing all the things you had said you hated. It would be like Led Zeppelin instead of the Sex Pistols. I wanted to continue the adventure. And if you couldn't continue the adventure at Madison Square Garden, well then, let's get lost in the swamps. It was a tour guaranteed to cause maximum confrontation. There remained the problem of Sid and Nancy, whose self-destructive drug binges were becoming more and more violent. Malcolm half-joked that Sid shouldn't think of taking a long lease on his new flat, although he did realize that the appalling influence Nancy had on Sid was something he should try and do something about. He deputized the band's roadies to kidnap her and try to put her on a plane with a one-way ticket. Sadly for everyone, the plan failed. The other problem was the withering hatred that existed between the band members and McLaren. A non-conductive undercurrent was the story that McLaren was planning to oust Rotten after the tour was over. The record company took control of the pistols as soon as they landed. Two ex-Vietnam vets were sent to escort them everywhere. There was even a rumor that Sid was to be handcuffed if he proved too difficult to handle. During the tour, after each gig, Jones and Cook went looking for booze and girls. John would talk endlessly to the record company guys, and Sid, wearing his I'm a mess badge, went on the prowl for smack. He was once found by his minders in a local hospital with self-inflicted knife wounds on his arm. The craziness got worse. There were rumors that the CIA and the FBI, even the British intelligence, were watching closely for fear of some kind of youth uprising. The band wouldn't talk to journalists unless they were individually paid. At one sold-out gig, there was a mini-riot. In San Antonio, a blood-smeared vicious with Give Me a Fix felt tipped onto his chest, whacked a member of the audience with his bass guitar. The audience responded by hurling a hail of bottles and cans at the band. As the Adam and the Ants guitarist Marco Pironi says in Rotten's book, Sid was desperate to get into anything that would kill him. Cook and Jones picked up heavy colds, decided they had enough of the road and left Rotten and Sid to continue by bus while they and McLaren took a plane to San Francisco. When Sid and John arrived to find they had been booked into a shabbier hotel than the others, Rotten, who was himself now suffering from the flu, took exception. They took the stage at the Winterland and Rotten shouted, Welcome to London, to massive roar from the audience, as well as a barrage of coins, tins, and spit. In its early stages, the set was a stormer, but when it broke down, it broke down for good, with Rotten sitting on his haunches, glaring at the crowd while the band endlessly played Iggy Pop's No Fun as badly as it could be played. Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? He asked, his valedictory comment as the Sex Pistols frontman. In the fallout from this, 
Jones, Cook, and McLaren decided to wrap up the band and go to Brazil. I said to John, relates Jones, I don't want to carry on. Someone's going to end up dead. I decided to go with Malcolm, a thing I regret. Jones and Cook went to Rio for the girls. McLaren went with scandalous ideas about appointing a new lead singer, Ronnie Biggs. Sid finally got his fix and his heart stopped. He was resuscitated and lived for a few months more. Both he and Rotten were left in America with no money or plane tickets home. An inauspicious end to the band that still hailed as the most exciting of the last 30 odd years. With the Pistols now over, the planning began. McLaren went back to London to arrange contracts for Ronnie Biggs and to pick up his film director mate Julian Temple and a film crew for the Brazil adventure. Richard Branson, who had long regarded Rotten as the power in the band and fearing that he was about to lose his investment, saw that now McLaren was no longer a factor, he could make his move. He took John off to Jamaica with Don Letts, the filmmaker, under the guise of using Leiden as an A&R man for some reggae acts he intended on signing, but in reality, was using the trip to win him over. However, the farce continued. McLaren, obsessed with his film project about the pistols but now lacking its star, sent a cameraman to Jamaica to get footage of John. When his advances were rejected by Rotten, the cameraman clumsily attempted to film the Virgin Party's guest of honor in secret from a hiding place in the bushes. When his cover was blown, he wound up being tossed into the pool. McLaren had a contingency plan. He filmed Big singing Sid's Belson Was a Gas with a promotional clip. The American label Warner Brothers saw that they were £200,000 in the hole as a result of McLaren's film deal and that all they had to show for it was a split band and a film with no star. They tried to unruffle Rotten's feathers and effect a reconciliation, but John was furious. Far from wanting any future involvement with McLaren, he called his lawyer to start proceedings for unpaid monies. His lawyer asked McLaren's company, Glitterbest, for accounts and in doing so, kicked off an eight-year battle of claim and counterclaim. Temple and McLaren went to Paris with Sid to get him to sing My Way on film, but Sid wasn't keen. Things came to a head at the hotel and McLaren phoned Sid and called him a junkie. Temple recalls, What must have happened is that Sid gave the phone to Nancy because Malcolm was still there going on when suddenly this paneled door flew open and there was Sid, in his underpants with a swastika on them and his motorcycle boots but nothing else. He grabbed Malcolm out of bed and said, You don't talk to me like that. And he shook Malcolm and Malcolm turned white and started to run, with no clothes on, down the floor of the hotel. The chambermaids were screaming, Monsieur, oh Monsieur. And finally, Malcolm ran into the elevator and Sin got in with him just before the doors closed. We all ran down the stairs and when the door opened, there was Malcolm kicked all the pieces. That was enough for Malcolm. He split and went back to England. Sid finally extracted a signed note from Malcolm saying he would no longer be his manager. And then, after we rewrote some of the My Way lyrics together, he finally broke down and sang the song. My Way was released as a double A-side Sex Pistols single with Punk Prayer, another Biggs fronted track that at one point was going to be called Kosh the Driver, a more than unsavory reference to the great train robbery. Rotten, now calling himself Leiden, wisely wanted nothing to do with it. McLaren took his commission and whatever else he needed to finance his film project, now called the Great Rock and Roll Swindle, and Ronald Biggs saw very little of the money. Had Malcolm robbed one of the great train robbers? Sid, hideously debilitated by heroin or the equally addictive treatment for heroin addiction, methadone, filmed a couple of more sequences for the movie, then went to New York with Nancy. They checked into the Chelsea Hotel, and she checked out of life, either by Sid's hand or by her own, or by the hand of a third party. To his credit, McLaren was instantly at hand with $50,000 in bail that he had loaned from Virgin. He rushed around hiring private detectives to look into the murky events of the evening and accused the police of failing to investigate all the details of the case properly. For example, a junkie from the same corridor Sid and Nancy were staying on had vanished the evening Nancy was killed, and some money was missing. But in the meantime, Sid was in the Bellevue Hospital in the psychiatric section after a suicide attempt. McLaren's motives were not entirely altruistic, though. A short while later, his shop started selling shirts bearing a picture of Sid with the caption, I'm alive, she's dead, I'm yours. On top of the 50 grand Branson had supplied for Sid's bail, Virgin gave Glitterbest £150,000 to breathe life into the film project. Branson's hooks were well and truly into McLaren now, something that surely wasn't in Malcolm's anti-record company manifesto. Leiden's case was coming to a head in the high court, and Warner Brothers wanted £200,000 back. Shortly after Nancy's death, they dropped the remaining pistols and sent some money to Leiden to help out with his lawyer's bill. Glitterbest was in big trouble, and McLaren entered into secret negotiations to sell up to Virgin. Leiden's lawyers alleged that just under £1 million was missing from the accounts, money that was used to make a film that Leiden was obliged to appear in, despite the fact he found the material obscene and offensive alleging that there were scenes that included incest, cocaine taking, necrophilia, group sex, gross violence, and sexual perversion. He wanted contractual freedom and damages, as well as some details of where all the money had gone. 
Malcolm became preoccupied with Leiden's lawyers, who were now threatening to the commencement of criminal charges. Meanwhile, Sid's horror story continued and then ended. Out from Bellevue, he went out clubbing and stuck a glass in the face of Patty Smith's brother, Todd. Whisked back to jail, he was suddenly, miraculously, out on bail again, and thrusted into the care of his delinquent mother, Anne Beverly. On the very evening of his release, she supplied him with the heroin that killed him. She herself died of a heroin overdose in 1996. Speaking about Sid's death, Leiden says in his book, There's nothing glorious in dying. Anyone can do it. Five days after Sid's fatal overdose, the Leiden vs. Glitterbest court case kicked off. It was then that the big red M wrinkle that appears on McLaren's forehead when he is under duress started flickering into view. When Cook and Jones turned turtle and transferred allegiances to Leiden, the M positively glowed. During this event, the judge sidestepped the substantive issues of the case and, having declared the Sex Pistols' partnership at an end, appointed a receiver to look over Glitterbest's financial affairs until another court could pick over the details of it all. A relieved McLaren scappered for Paris the following day. The winners were, to some extent, Leiden, Cook, and Jones. Vicious had sealed his own fate. But the real triumph belonged to Richard Branson, who now had commanding shares in all the existing Sex Pistols material, as well as a newly formed public image. He'd also signed Cook and Jones's projected band, The Professionals, and he held rights to the soon-to-be-completed film. He even offered McLaren via Telex £20,000 for a first Malcolm McLaren single. It stated, Please stop believing this conspiracy theory. There was and is none. McLaren took that as an admission that Branson was indeed trying to buy him off. When Branson got word of that, he took the gloves off. McLaren had gone too far. At one point, McLaren was trying to get money from Branson so he could finish the movie, and when Branson wouldn't budge, he visited him on his houseboat. McLaren told Virgin News in 06, I decided to visit Branson on his boat, which was parked on the Regent's Canal in London, to demand that he buy me out of the Sex Pistols so that I could finish the great rock and roll swindle. I thought Branson had been two-faced in his dealings with me, so to register my disrespect, I urinated on his office carpet. I'm not sure how he reacted, as I immediately took my leave. Virgin was under orders to rush release the soundtrack from the upcoming movie to counter the threat posed by imports from the French company Barclay, a threat that McLaren could doubtlessly trigger. McLaren, justifiably, thought the album was a shambles and demanded it be withdrawn, but Branson ignored his bleeding and McLaren was powerless to act further. He hid away in Paris for a year, licking his wounds. It wasn't until 1986 that the proceedings came to court for the final showdown. Leiden's and McLaren's zany appearances contrasted with the wigged and gowned counsel. Paul Cook turned up and sat quietly at the back of the room. Steve Jones, who was now into heroin himself, wouldn't or couldn't make the journey from Los Angeles. Over two excruciating days, with costs running at 10,000 pounds a day, the minute details of McLaren and Leiden's relationship were disseminated. Leiden, the doyen of the Pistols Project and the one who John Savage says gave it life, edged ahead in the battle with McLaren. The Svengali was increasingly exhausted by it. The case could have creaked on for months, but Malcolm surely couldn't have. The final settlement was an almost complete capitulation on his part. The band would be given control of McLaren's label Glitter Best and the associated Matrix Best. The assets would be transferred from the receiver to the band. McLaren's ambition to grab the film along the way wasn't to happen. John Savage pinpoints a phrase used by counsel. McLaren put together the violent and aggressive punk style. It was his original literary work. So there was a consensus that he could claim, if he wished, to be the progenitor of punk, but little else. In Paris, he hung out with those around the Barclay label, and did some African-based musical scores for some risque movies. The French were very impressed with the rock and roll swindler, and he could take tea with the likes of Sergei Gainsbourg and the band Telephone, and enthrall them with all the tales of Sid and Johnny. He came up with a plan to make a movie about three young English girls in Paris who encounter a French pop manager. Using the tourist attractions of the city as the backdrop, there would be numerous seductions. When Malcolm went back to London to try to raise some money for the project from Arista, they were horrified by the subject matter. Another film tentatively titled The Mile High Club, and again starring young girls, met similar resistance. That put movie projects on hold. He was casting around for something else to do, something he could make some money from, when his eyes fell on a young man who had been lurking around his shop and flirting with Jordan, Stuart Leslie Goddard, who would soon become Adam Ant. Adam idolized Malcolm. He wanted what Malcolm apparently had, the kind of juice that could power a bunch of rega muffins to stardom. Malcolm didn't see the same thing in Adam as Jordan had. Instead, he took a thousand pounds from the aspiring star to act as his star maker consultant. He gave Adam's band a load of rhythm-based tapes to study, and somewhat miraculously, they got into the groove and started reproducing things in his fashion. The problem was that Adam couldn't do it, or Malcolm didn't think he could, so he drove a wedge into the outfit. Adam had to go. McLaren passed the job on. The band were to dump him, or specifically Dave Barb, the drummer. 
I was so under the euphoria of Malcolm's personality, said Barb. I would have gone out and shot somebody if he told me. At the same time as Adam was in the dumper, Bow Wow Wow were born. He's a band breaker, grumbled Paul Cook of McLaren at some other time and about some other band. McLaren, the pop genius who had once declared war on the record business through the Sex Pistols, was now sharpening his spears for a second assault. Walkmans were the new technology, the iPods of their day. Home taping was becoming an issue. Ever riding the weight of controversy and with a new band to hype, albeit singerless, he wrote C30, C60, C90, go, a song about stealing tunes from the radio. The problem was that Adam Ant was showing some true grit. In the face of adversity, he pulled together some musicians, vowing to beat McClare into the draw. He had been working on the African beats, as had the new Bow Wows. He could do that. Malcolm, in the meantime, started drilling his troops in the Black Arts. A chance meeting between one of the band and the 14-year-old Mayant Mayant A, Don Luin, later to be known as Annabella, in a dry cleaners in the West End lane gave them their missing jigsaw piece. Bow Wow Wow had discovered a singer. EMI, once bitten but apparently not twice shy, allowed McLaren to wheedle 50,000 pounds out of them for the Bow Wow Wow single. One single. If it ever needed saying, Malcolm McLaren can talk up a perfect storm. How else would he have gotten Britain's biggest record label to invest in him twice, especially in a track about home taping? In the event, the record stiffed. McLaren cried conspiracy, alleging that the British Phonographic Institute had suddenly twigged on the subject matter of the lyrics and had killed the record. Then he fired up the band to take direct action. They obediently went to EMI to wreck an office and terrorize a minion. Instead of being intimidated, EMI obligingly coughed up another 20,000 pounds in return for 12 tracks. They reasoned that since their company made blank cassette tapes as well as pre-recorded ones, they were in a win-win situation. Next, McLaren arranged a photo shoot for the record that, by virtue of the raunchy subject matter, caused not a little concern amongst the Bow Wowers. Even loyal cohorts like Malcolm's friend and Sex Pistol chronicler Fred Vermoral thought that Malcolm had pushed the boundaries a tad too far. The man's a voyeur, said Dave Barb. He's also a great survivor and somehow managed to crawl from under that particular wreckage unscathed. When the album came out, it died, but the band had developed a sound. Malcolm reasoned, however, that it might be necessary to find a new singer. Where have we all heard that one before? Into the spotlight stepped Boy George, who was yet to set up Culture Club. The gig never worked out, and George moved onwards and very definitely upwards. But say what you like about Malcolm, he sure can dig out the talent, even if sometimes he doesn't quite know what to do with it when he's got it. Bow Wow Wow had gone as far as they were likely to go with EMI and McLaren was back on the phone hustling, but no one wanted to know. Strangely, McLaren's name and any artist associated with him either caused mirth and ridicule around the industry, sometimes companies wouldn't even give them an appointment, or a massive respect. After a series of rejections, Malcolm was reputedly crying with frustration when voila, he was suddenly able to extract guarantees of $750,000 over three albums from RCA in America. Bow Wow Wow's debut album with RCA needed a cover with that certain McLaren spice, not to mention some accompanying press furor. Annabella was coerced, with the aid of vodka and against her mother's wishes, into stripping off for a depiction of Manet's Le Déjeuner sous l'herbe. Sure enough, she was labeled that cheap nymphite by a tabloid and everyone was happy. There were tours and great publicity and things looked very favorable for Malcolm, McLaren, and Bow Wow Wow, but those waves of NUI washed over yet again. He moaned to journalist David Thomas, You see, with the Sex Pistols, I was a manager. But also, I wasn't a manager, if you see what I mean. But with Bow Wow Wow, I was becoming too much a manager. He revealed some remarkable flaws in his song spotting talent by rejecting a mix of Go Wild in the Country, but the company went ahead and released it in spite of him. It went into the charts at number 7. He also rejected the follow-up I Want Candy, and it went in at number 9. Dave Barb said, I only wish he had screwed off earlier. He'd never do anything by the front door. It always had to have some weird angle. Effectively, McLaren had left, but no contracts were dissolved and he went on receiving royalties for a good while after his departure, a time in which he signed himself to Charisma as a solo artist. The band dissolved a couple of years later. Bassist Leigh Gorman went on to write Hippie Chick for the one-hit wonder band Soho. Drummer Dave Barbarossa had chart success with Republica. Guitarist Matthew Ashman died in 1995. Annabella and Gorman reunited for a tour in the late 90s. Malcolm McLaren continues to be a force in the music industry and elsewhere. The instinctive opportunist, Nigel Kennedy called him the Diaghilev of the Borsell Boys because he made opportunism into an art form. Great British eccentric, he has had numerous solo hits including Duck Rock, Buffalo Gals, Madam Butterfly, Double Dutch, Waltz Darling, and most recently About Her, which features on the Kill Bill 2 soundtrack. 
In 2005, McLaren was accused of plagiarizing a French artist's song, but he was cleared of the charges in November. Movies still loom large, perhaps largest in his life. Indeed, it could have been said that until recently, his career had been a failure, as far as he was concerned, because he'd never made one. Pop music seems to only have ever been a means to an end for him, and the end was films. McLaren is memorable for his pitches, though. Linda Opst, the one-time head of Geffen Films, reckons McLaren's pitch for a film called Beauty and the Beast was the most memorable pitch of my career. It was a performance of stellar quality that I have since discovered was entirely rehearsed because he later did the same pitch for David Geffen, word for word, beat for beat, step for step. The movie that somehow mixed the fairy story with the life of Christian Dior was never made. He spent two years trying to get a film made about Led Zeppelin manager Peter Grant, the manager's manager, but Grant failed to secure permissions for the use of the band's material. The project died when Peter died. Observer writer Peter Culshaw spent some time with Malcolm early in 2004 when McLaren was talking about his relationship with Steven Spielberg. Quote, McLaren was formally employed twice at CBS, and then as a kind of personal ideas man for Steven Spielberg. There was the attempt to turn Stephen Hawking into the most brilliant pop star and have him make love to Chrissy Hind, a CD-ROM that I tried hard to sell as a bridging between art and science. He developed such projects as heavy metal surf Nazis. Think The Magnificent Seven meets The Lord of the Rings, featuring a gang led by a surfer who was born in the sea and has a magical surfboard. Of Los Angeles, he says, At first it seemed the place to reinvent yourself, but finally I have to admit, its malevolence creeps through the walls at night and slowly depressed the hell out of me. This is in spite of his affair with the model Lauren Hutton, the beauty queen who graced the cover of Vogue 14 times in two years and who, the story goes, seduced Malcolm by surrounding herself in a bed of flowers outside his apartment door. Spielberg led him out of his contract, provided he come back with his best idea in a year's time. The year over, Malcolm waltzes in and does one of his hyper pitches. It's a musical, he tells Spielberg. And it will be Oscar Wilde discovering rock and roll by accident on one of his lecture tours in the Deep South in the 1880s. End quote. Incredibly, Spielberg got excited about the nonsense, flew out Tom Stopper to write a script, gave Malcolm $50,000, and then when Malcolm's magic had worn off and he re-examined the project in the cold light of day, pulled the plug. Heroic failures, it has to be said. But back to the pistols. Malcolm's downfall, his blind spot, was a low boredom threshold and his conviction that Sid was the talent. The best songs in the Sex Pistols recorded were the ones without John, such as Come On Everybody, he says. At least Vicious could actually sing, and he was potentially a much bigger star. Many would vehemently beg to differ. In 2001, the inveterate mischief maker contemplated standing for London mayor. His policies included scraping museum charges, making adult education available for one pound a year, setting up brothels opposite the House of Parliament, the decriminalization of cannabis, and the selling of alcohol in libraries. He is undoubtedly proud of his son, Joe Corr, who runs the agent provocateur fashion shop. Ace hype merchant PR Mark Borkowski recalls McLaren as one of the three geniuses I've met. Julie Burchill says, We are all children of Thatcher and McLaren. As for another PM, McLaren dismisses Tony Blair as the first karaoke prime minister. In 2004, John Lydon made some programs for Channel 5 about sharks, a hilarious irony. Malcolm finally got to make a film, Fast Food Nation. Eric Sklosser's acclaimed British-produced expose of the U.S. food industry, starring Ethan Hawke and Bruce Willis. Malcolm was co-producer, and it was his idea to make it fictional rather than as a documentary. May it not be his last. End quote. The following is my full interview with Sex Pistols bassist Glenn Matlock. All the interviews on my channel are original. I'm the one putting them together by myself. If you want to support, the best way to do so is to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about how your tenure with the Sex Pistols ended. Could you clarify for me exactly what happened? I left. I left. It, it, it became a different thing. Yeah, you know, when I was in the band, I saw it. It was like the kids of the early who, you know, a band by the kids, for the kids. And then it, as soon as we got a bit of traction, Malcolm kind of wanted to keep everything in the state of flux. He was stirring it up between me and John. And it, it was becoming this kind, kind of cartoon strip thing. I was quoted as saying it was like being in the monkeys when I left, not because I wanted to be in the monkeys, but it was, he was pitching it as a put together band and that just wasn't true. We formed ourselves in Malcolm's shop, but he didn't form us. And I firmly believe that we, he was very good at helping us at getting things going and nobody would have heard of us if it wasn't for him, but nobody would have heard of him if it wasn't for us. 
So it was quite a symbiotic relationship there. But it just became too much, and I didn't think Steve and Paul had my back, even though I'd written a lot of, not all the songs, but I come up with a lot of the riffs and the tunes and things. And it was their loss. Either back me up, or that's how I walked, and I walked, and that was it. But I thought I had the last laugh, because in 1996, when we reformed, they could have asked anybody in the world to play bass, and they asked me. So... Yeah. I think they saw the error of their ways. Mm -hmm. And what was the inspiration behind the reunion? Well, I think everything, even still. You know, everything we've all tried to do individually is always measured against the Sex Pistols. People are always clamouring for the Sex Pistols to get back together again. And it kind of overshadows what we've tr all tried to do individually all these years. And um, we thought we might as well give it to them. Plus, earn some money out of it. You know, none of, nobody really made much money out of the band. Hmm. And we did quite well. Yeah. But that was 20 odd years ago. Yeah. Was it a difficult decision for you to leave the Sex Pistols in 77? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Might not. It might not have been the cleverest move. But there was a whole bunch of stuff going on, you know, and I've been approached by EMI before we got dumped saying that, you know, there's. We know there's a problem and we hope you sort it out. But if you don't sort it out, we'd be more than interested in anything that you come up with. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I thought, well, if they think that, other record companies will. And me and John were like that all the time. And um, it just seemed to be more trouble than it's worth. That's quite a good expression, you know. Yeah. So I, I walked. But then it was turned around that I'd been sacked, but it's not true. I walked. And I've read that prior to your departure, you had already started writing some music for a potential second record. Is this true? Well, I'm always writing songs. and I, I had a band after that called The Rich Kids, and the first single we put out was called Rich Kids by Rich Kids. Now, whether it would end up being called Rich Kids, but John could have quite easily written some words for that, and that could have been a, a Sex Pistols song with the other guys playing on it. This is a hypothetical question, but if the Pistols were forming today with how different the business is, would you guys have approached things differently? Well, that's a good question, but I really don't know how that would manifest itself at all. Mm -hmm. See, I, I, there was a physicality to what we did. We all met because Malcolm McLaren had the coolest shop in, in the Western world. And because I got a job working there, and then Stephen Paul used to come to try and knit clothes, but had a band going, and I met them. And then Steve was, fancies himself as a singer, but he was like a cross between Tom Jones and Steve Ellis from Steve Ellis's Love Affair. It wasn't quite the thing. And then he learned to play the guitar good. And then John came along, and he was like the icing on the cake. But we all had to physically meet. And if he was online somehow, I don't, I don't know that would happen. But then people obviously do because they still film ba form bands and go and do things. I do, it would, it's just different, you know. It's like comparing apples with oranges. Yeah, no, I hear you. They're both round. <laughs> so I saw an interesting interview you did a couple of years back where you mentioned that as the Sex Pistols, you guys weren't trying to be a political band. You were just speaking your minds, so to speak. So. In your view, is it incorrect to label the Sex Pistols as a political band? Well, I don't think we ever went out and said vote for so-and-so and vote for so-and-so. A political band? No, I don't think we were. We were just quite antisocial, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, something I've always been curious about is uh, John is Irish. And, uh, you know, in the 70s... He, he's half Irish. Half Irish. Okay, he's half yeah. Irish. In the 70s, that's, you know, the troubles were very much... An issue. Did that influence your music at all, the Troubles, in any way? Yeah, I think it did. There was, there was, um, hey, I think it influenced because John had a chip on his shoulder. You know, he's, it, I mean, he's not half Irish. I think his, both his mum and dad are Irish, but he was second generation Irish, you know, brought up in, in, in London and in England. So that must affect you somehow. He had a chip on his shoulder. And yes, the IRA was bombing. There was a real air of despondency and in London, there's power cuts, there was, everybody was on strike, there was rubbish piled high in the streets when they come through. It was a real era of despondency. God Save the Queen was originally called No Future, and it seemed to me, and to John, I would presume, 
that there was no future unless we did something about it for ourselves. You know, and then when the record came out, it, somebody at the record company realised that it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee and the song, the first line of the song was God Save the Queen. None of the words were changed, but it, it, they just changed the title of the song. Yeah. But it was originally called No Future, and that's what it seemed like. Yeah, and I've, I've heard that uh, this is, I guess, somewhat of a conspiracy, but I've heard that that song of yours was supposed to be number one in the UK charts, but that was the same week as the Jubilee, so the charts didn't allow it to happen. Is this true? Funny that. I'd left the band by then, but yeah, that's what happened. But I could have been a number one songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> if the Pistols had stayed around and you guys didn't end up breaking up, would you have evolved out of punk eventually, like into you know more poppy music? No, I think we were doomed to. Um, I think we were doomed to kind of split up when we were really. Maybe there might have been another record, but I can't see us down the line doing some sort of ballad thing, you know, like the Stones did Angie and John singing that. Hey, Angie! Oh, Angie! <laughs> <laughs> you guys should have done a cover version of that. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> well, when we reformed, I, I did. There was two uh, pretty good ideas floating around. We had to do a live album. And Steve Jones lives in LA. And where are we going to do the live album? And he said, how about doing it at Caesar's Palace? You know, because he likes Tom Jones and all that kind of stuff. And I thought it was fantastic. Sex Pistols were live from Caesar's Palace. And we approached them and they wrote back and said, no, we do not want you. And please do not ask your friends to contact us. No <laughs> way, really? <laughs> A telegram from the mob kind of thing but I thought if we were going to make a new album we should do the last thing that anybody would think of doing and that was a rock opera and we could have called it Sydney you know that would have been quite good that would have been amazing I know you guys ended in 2008 the last time you ever were together any chance you guys might get back together at some point I don't know it's, it's always been last minute last time we've done it I don't know I don't really care. I don't get up in the morning thinking about it. No worries. But I would, I would consider it if it did happen. But um, I think with a couple of us, they'd have a, a pretty good reinforcement underneath the stage. And I'm not talking about me and Paul. So I read an interesting article a little while back. Um, apparently in the 90s, uh, Joe Strummer was thinking about getting the Clash back together. But then mm -hmm. the Pistols, you guys came back first. So he decided not to bring back the Clash because he didn't want it to look like he was coming back on your coattails. Do you know if that's true at all? I don't know if that's true, but I'm friends with Mick Jones. I haven't seen him for a while. But when we'd done the shows, he was saying, what's it like getting back up there? I said, it was quite a juggle, really, you know, for this reason, that and the other. And I knew he'd sort of gone and hung out with Joe a little bit, but Joe was sadly wrenched from the surf but before his time so that put an end to that one yeah um yeah, what, what was um the relationship between the pistols and the clash i, I was good on the anarchy tour i me and mcjohn's room to get together you know everybody had to share a room and i've shared it with me so yeah we were sort of mates um i've always tried to support my friends in their own covers um, yeah, and then when I got the rich kids together, they let me use their rehearsal place for nothing, which was Andy. It was like a back scratching exercise. But then also, I remember doing a photo session with Bob Gruen in Denmark Street, which is like the Tim Pan Alley of England. Yeah, I've been there, yeah. And we, we was outside on the street, and one of the stranglers walked past and said hi. And I said hello back, and John said to me, you don't talk to them, do you? <laughs> Something I've always been very curious about is, you know, in 76, 75, right around that time when the punk scene was really starting to develop, punk wasn't really a thing prior to that. So what did you guys think of yourselves as? We always thought we were the Sex Pistols, and the bands that came after us were punk. Do you feel yeah. that punk is an appropriate label for the Pistols? If you look it up in the dictionary, what it means, no, because it's it's not the most pleasant term in the world. Mm. It's a, it's a prison, a punk, is somebody who receives and, and doesn't give out, if you see what I mean. How did you feel about the commercialization of punk, in a sense? 
Ähm, keine Ahnung. We deliberately signed to AMI records because we wanted as much. If you write a song, you want as many people to hear it as possible. And when you record it, you want to record it as best as you possibly can. And when it finally comes out, you want it to be promoted as best as you possibly can. So if everybody hears it and likes it, that's great. And if everybody hears it and don't like it, that's fair enough. But if nobody's heard about it, it's a real piss off. So you want a whole team behind you. So I don't think the commercial thing is wrong. You know, having been in the Sex Pistols, one of the most iconic bands in history, you've co-written songs that will always be cherished and remembered. So what inspires you to keep making new music after all these years? Well, it's work. It's work. It's, um, I, I'm fortunate enough, I mean, not at the moment, and the rug's been pulled from under my feet a little bit because of what's going on. I should have been in America and Canada in the um, beginning of March. I was going to open up for a big show with the Dropkick Murphys. They asked me to do this in Patrick's Day show in Boston. And then I was going to do about 10 solo acoustic shows, which I do quite a lot. I was coming up to Canada, Toronto and Montreal. And then I had some more shows around through the Midwest and the East Coast. And I was going to end up in New York and overseas the mixing of a new album that we got in the camp. I like to earn money from what I'm doing now because it makes me feel more of a man about myself. I think I still write pretty good songs. I put on a good live show. I think all my songs are the same old <laughs> message, really. Yes. <laughs> Just talk about what's on your mind and what's on your mind is... Well, There's just something hanging in there, really. That's the general thing. I think it's the same thing for most people, yeah. really. I, I think... One of the best quotes I've ever read in the music business was somebody asked John Lennon if they if he if he was trying to write songs for the kids still, you know, when he made when he was older, and he thought about it and he said, no, I'm trying to write songs for the kids who grew up me, and that's I think that's what I'm kind of do, you know, we all have our um, you know the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and it's how you roll with it really. And, it's, you know, whether you're writing a song that you're not going to give up on some lady or some lady's giving up on you or life or the politicians or you can read between the lines on that. I like playing, you know, I like seeing what's out there. Um, and I like the immediacy of doing a solo show as well, you know, because it's, whether it's a song you wrote 40 years ago or 40 minutes ago, when people connect with it, it's a real big buzz. Yeah, that's very cool. You know, what do you think about um, the music industry today in terms of the internet? Like, it's completely revolutionized things. Some people say it's bad. Some people say it's great. Where do you fall along the lines? Um, it's great if you understand it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think younger kids have a, have a real handle on it mm -hmm. because they've grown up with it. I like to not be a Luddite and try and encompass it all, but the more I know about the internet and, and you know, and viral spreading and blah, 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 yeah. the less I know. Like, I think the internet's great in that it gives you access as a musician to just have a worldwide release instantly. But yeah. my so, one... Go ahead. Yeah, but as you know, everybody around the world is watching it. And these days, thanks to Steve Jobs, and again, we're talking here on Skype through my older laptop, Everybody is a musician, everybody's a writer, everybody's a photographer, everybody's a DJ, everybody's a filmmaker, and there's so much dross out there. Yeah. Then you got to wade through it all. Yeah, but, that's the big problem. So outside of the Sex Pistols, um, what work are you most proud of as a musician in your career? Well, the most fun thing I did, I don't know, about eight or nine years ago now, my all-time favorite bands are Faces. And I played with them. I was in the band. We only did about 10 gigs. But the last gig we did, we had Lion the Fuji Festival in Japan in front of 50,000 people. And it was the band. I used to stand in front of the mirror when I was 14 and couldn't play, pretending I was in it. And I, I'm playing. Rod Stewart didn't do it, but it was Ronnie with Kenny Jones, Ian McLagan. And, um, yeah, that was kind of pretty cool. I like, I like doing that. I'm quite proud of what I'm doing now, actually. I've I'm, I'm managed to keep going. I've got 
great players to get to play with. On the show it go, it doesn't show it go, it's a good to go album. That's El Slick and Sandra and Phantom, both mates of mine. Um, the new record we've got in the can is pretty good. I think you're as good as your next record, really. Yeah. And I think what I have kind of got going for me, and I think a lot of the punk people is that we was never idiots in the first place. Nobody really made that much money that they can afford to go and live in an ivory tower and become divorced from reality. So we've all kept our feet on the ground and we've all led quite interesting lives. Um, and we got a lot to sing about. Whether it's the same old shit, there's a few different words describing the same old shit. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of music that you might want to make in the future, is there anything that you would like to do that you haven't done yet musically? Um, yeah, do you know what? I, I, there was a shop open. I had to get something sorted out of my car. And there was a shop open, a, mu- a sort of second-hand music shop, and they got a few double basses in there. And I went and had a go on one. And I can get round it. And I keep promising I'm going to buy myself one. Because I, I make some Slim Jim and he comes over. And he's always short of a stand-up bass player. And I could do that. But also I've been listening to a lot of sort of bebop jazz. And... Um, I thought, oh, maybe I can sit at home in lockdown, practice in my scales, and get a gig in the jazz band. Do you have any memorable stories from your time playing with the Faces? Oh, all right. When I was playing with the Faces, we'd done some gigs, and then we hadn't done some gigs for about 10 days. And then we had to get an early morning flight and a little late-seater aeroplane to fly to Denmark. And we had to meet this out about an hour's drive out of town in some little airfield and the sun was coming up and Mick Hucknall was a singer. And, um, but it was Ronnie Wood and Kenny Jones and me and Neil McGlag and we were, sun's coming up and he's a red-headed bloke and a bit pale but as the sun's coming up, I th- he's got a bit of a suntan. I said, hey, Mick, you caught the sun, you've been away? And he said, yeah. He said, I went to Spain. I said, cool, what part of Spain did you go to? He said, I went to the Basque country. Have you ever been? I said, I've yeah. driven through it. But... And I said, what made you go there? And he said, well, he said, a few years back, I had a DNA test done. I said, yeah. He said, um, they found some, quite a lot of DNA, uh, Basque DNA in my blood, which is quite rare. And it is true, it's quite rare. So I thought I'd go to the Basque country. Loved it. And every chance I get, I go back there. I said, cool. He said, you should I said, well, go to the Basque country. I've been through it. And he said, no, no, you should have a DNA test done. I said, well, why? He said, well, you should, you know, you never know what you might find out. And I said, well, that's exactly what I'm worried about. And Ronnie Wood's going, what's going on here then? And um, he said, well, like what? I said, well, me, they might find out uh, I come from Manchester. Right, like, Arnold's from Manchester. We're already went, what's going on here? You're all Londoners. I don't know what I'm doing in this band. Like, <laughs> that was quite funny. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Mick Hutton was a big star over there. You know, he'll do things. Now, of course, the Faces were not a punk band. You guys were mostly a blues rock band. So in terms of the different genres of rock and roll, punk rockers, at least in the 70s, were generally known to dislike progressive rock. What are your thoughts on progressive rock? Progressive rock. There's many schools of progressive rock. Um, and some of it was all right. Most of it was turgid nonsense. About six or seven years ago, I did a gig with my band. We were doing a festival, I think, called Wayfest. And we played, and on later on, with Jeff Toll. And they opened up with Living in the Past, which I love. It's fantastic. So I went rushing down the front. And I'm watching them do it all the way through. It was great. And I could rush down the front because i just come out from backstage and I was leaning on the barrow. As soon as they finished, they went straight into Thick as a Brick, which is turgid nonsense. And I turned around and I had to pick my way through the crowd, which was about 20,000 people are going, he's come out from the Sex Pistols. What's he doing? And like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> so you mentioned that you performed at the DMZ between South Korea and North Korea. What was that experience like? Well, there's a guy called Stephen Budd. There's a whole coterie of promoters and things and people to do with Glastonbury and all they do these sort of left, not left wing, left field kind of festivals. And it's all 
you know, then some of them are like record companies and they're, they're going to discover somebody over there and maybe once in the blue moon they do. But it's kind of this hands across the sea kind of thing. And um, I said to this guy, Stephen, what are you up to? And he said, well, I might be doing this thing at, you know, in Korea. And I said, well, that sounds interesting. He said, do you want to come? And I said, yeah, I'll be interested. So they flew me over and I played with some bands. And I just wanted to go and have a look, see. I didn't know what to expect when I got there. And it was fantastic. Um, wow. Yeah. How um, close were you to the border with North Korea? Right on the right on the border. That's insane! Wow. The, the actual it was like a mini festival over a weekend. They did have an event on actually on the border, but the main event was just outside the demilitarized zone. But it was funny when you get there. There was a burnt out train that they kept as a thing, and there was a little state. I didn't play it that big, but there was some steps going up this kind of looked like a hill. And I said, if you go up there, is that to see North Korea? I said, well, you can see North Korea if you go up there. But because nobody lives in the DMZ zone, they can go and farm at sunrise and have to leave by sunset. There's all this wildlife there in the steppes. But to see this rare breed of ibis that thrives there because nobody lives there anymore. And this is on the on top of this big anti-tank truck that they bought. I mean, it's all, and the, the countryside is beautiful. It is really, it messes with your mind, you know, it's like, it, it could be a nuclear bomb any minute, and there people are looking at this rare breed of ibis. <laughs> and then that, down the road, there was a farmer's market that sells honey collected from the DMZ zone, which is really pure, because there's no pollution. Yeah, that's, weird. you're right, actually, that makes sense. <laughs> And not only is it a bit weird, I I went there to do that and then I got invited back for this other sort of like Camden Rocks Festival, which where people play in different clubs in Seoul. And there's like a downtown Seoul area, which is like the, I don't know, Portobello Road or what's that street in um, in uh, Toronto? Is it Queen something? You know, where all the... Queen, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of that kind of area. And I'd met this guy called Chacha. He's like the Paul Weller of... Of Korea, and he played with me with these other guys first time round, second time round. He was doing the opening night DJ slot, right downtown Korea, uh, a sale in South Korea. It's all quite funky, although the rest of sales like Tokyo. You know, it's brand spanking new, but there's an old bit. And his first record he puts on it goes. So hang on, I know this. And he goes, down, 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 down,